fourteenth day, upper wind month, 1 CE, 1700 hours. Draudelin fought to keep her regal mask from crumbling into incredulity as she gazed down at the top of Captain Insera's head. It was nice to see that he was an honest man, but she felt that he had crossed the line between honesty and idiocy. Confirmation that Heifetz Garrison had survived proved to be a heartening piece of news for Draudelin and her court. It was a tiny achievement in the vast sea of failure that was the Draconic Kingdom's efforts to resist the Beastmen, but everyone clung to those bits of hope nonetheless. In the past, such a feat would have merited a great banquet, criers dispatched to praise the garrison's determination and resilience against their dreaded foe. They couldn't afford the banquet, but her court made sure that the people knew of Heifert's valiant stand. For her part, she could only welcome him with a smile and lavish her gratitude upon him and his men for their exceptional efforts. Before she could speak, however, the captain cast himself to the floor in a magnificent flying kowtow to grovel at the base of her days. He begged her forgiveness while at the same time accepting his fate for violating the sanctity of her laws. His display left her speechless for a good dozen seconds before she could say anything, which spilt out of her mouth of its own accord. You, Draudilin said, are an idiot. Yes, your majesty. I am an idiot. Draudilin's tiny frown shifted as she glanced at Baroness Saradnik. The woman was definitely laughing behind her expressionless mask. Her courtiers, however, were half aghast at and half condemning of the man's conduct. Your Majesty, Salacia said, please do not soil your hands with this foul miscreant's blood. We'll have him taken out behind the palace to be eviscerated. We just emptied the palace quarter of corpses, Lady Sorul. F forgive me, Your Majesty. We'll have him taken outside the city walls and eviscerated. Captain Scarvo, take in Sarah away. Oi! Stop trying to eviscerate our officers. We have few enough as it is. You bunch have spent too much time studying the law and not enough time practicing it. Draudilin turned her gaze back to Captain Insera, lavishing a smile upon him. Raise your head, Captain Insera. You have our pardon for your transgressions and may return to your duties once your audience is concluded. The man pushed himself off of the ground, his face a mess of tears and mucus. Why your, your majesty? He stumbled forward to her dais with a sob, reaching for her crossed ankles. Draudelin tucked them against her throne. Enna stepped forward and interposed herself between them. Two guards caught the man and dragged him back to a safe distance. Draudelin frowned at Inna's back. You're the Prime Minister right now, Inna, not my lady-in-waiting. Draudelin glanced at Sabos, who had not budged from his place at her shoulder. There were whispers going around about how her escort was not protecting her properly and was in reality a spy. Draudilin, however, sensed that no physical attacks would be allowed to reach her so long as he was around. Know your place, Captain. Inna's voice was cold, you've just been forgiven for a crime, are you attempting to commit yet another? I'm sorry. Draudilin let out a quiet breath. They wouldn't be able to get anywhere like this. Now is as good a time as any for a recess she declared. We shall reconvene in two hours. She waited as her court filed out of the hall, taking note of the various cliques that had formed. They had changed somewhat from before the siege of her capital, mostly due to the duties of the court and her ministries being redistributed to the palace staff. Though court factions were not prevalent in the Draconic Kingdom's politics, they still formed as a product of human nature. Faction heads had appeared in the form of her interim ministers. Their following mostly consisted of other nobles working in their departments. The relationship between each faction was cooperative, so she felt that there was nothing to fear when it came to destructive internal rivalries impeding the recovery of the country. When all that remained were her ladies-in-waiting and her guards, Draudelin rose from her throne. Lady Wenwin will attend to us, she said. The rest of you can take a break until everyone comes back. Captain Scarvo, please invite Baroness Saradnik to join us for dinner. Draudelin rose from her throne and stepped out onto the balcony, allowing herself a small sense of satisfaction as she watched a river barge disembark from the port and unfurl its sails. It picked up speed, gliding west towards Seagate. River traffic was always one of the greatest indicators of the Draconic Kingdom's health. It was not just the primary driver for her country's economic well-being, but also the lifeline to lands which were so often ravaged by their beastman neighbors. This time, however, nearly all of her support was sourced from the Sorceress Kingdom. As promised, 
their strange barges continued to deliver all manner of goods to the capital in an unprecedented effort to aid in the Draconic Kingdom's recovery. While it should rightly be considered a miraculous boon, the Sorceress Kingdom's assistance also brought with it worries harbored not just by herself, but also by her court. Well, I should be able to address at least one of the big ones now. Dinner was served a half hour later. Baroness Saradnik entered the throne room and headed to the table set aside for the Sorceress Kingdom's delegates, but Draudilin gestured for the young noblewoman to join her. Come, Lady Saradnik, she said, there is no need to be so distant. We would rather not have three different people at three different tables shouting at one another across the hall. At her prompting, both Jolene and Lady Zaradnik came to join her. Unfortunately, Sabos remained standing behind Draw Dylan's shoulder. She knew that it was the proper place for him to be, but she would have far preferred that he sit beside her. Draw Dylan stirred the thick oat porridge that had become a regular sight at her meals. It was greatly at odds with its marbled black porcelain bowl and her silver spoon. She decided to start with a safe topic. Lady Zaradnik, Countess Calling mentioned that the grain delivered to Orokalon comes from your domain. Is this true? Yes, your majesty, Lady Zaradnik replied. It is most of my territory's production from last year. Having such a surplus is, to be frank, absurd. Our Minister of Internal Affairs here has been going crazy trying to figure out how such a thing can be possible. I'm not sure what speculations have been circulating in your majesty's court, the baroness replied, but it's fairly straightforward. I am a frontier noble and my territory was over 99% undeveloped when the Duchy of E. Rental was annexed. My domain has seen unprecedented industrial growth since then, but the human population remains relatively small, around 1500 subjects. Nearly all of what we produce is exported. If that was the case, it was likely that Baroness Saradnik and her subjects were ridiculously wealthy. Draw Dylan and her subjects were facing a similar situation, though the cause was different. The Baroness territory likely hadn't seen a mass depopulation of its tenants as the Draconic Kingdom had. You mentioned human population, Lady Saradnik, Jolene said. Who else do you count amongst your subjects? Oof. Why did you go there? Though the fact that the Sorceress Kingdom was a multiracial nation was known by her court, many of the realities that came with their relationship with the Sorceress Kingdom had not truly sunk into the collective consciousness of her people. As Countess Corlin had mentioned in her exclave proposal, it was probably best to ease them into the aspects that involved other races considering the Draconic Kingdom's history. Some of the populations are challenging to keep track of, Lady Wenwin, Baroness Saradnik said but there should be somewhere in the vicinity of 12,000 goblins, a thousand ogres and forty trolls and the upper reaches of the Katza River. Warden's Vale, my original barony, has an additional 200 lizardmen. The mountains around my territory have at least one mountain troll and his tribe and two races of demi-humans that I jointly refer to as the Kronos. One race is a species of druidic demi-human that I haven't seen elsewhere and the other is a race of large feeled beastmen. The Kronos keep filtering into my territory and they're spreading all over the place, I think there are around 200 of the druids and over a thousand of the feeled beastmen now. You have beastman subjects? Jolene's eyes grew wide. They're fairly reclusive, but yes. They aren't the only race of beastmen in the sorceress kingdom, either. But, what do they eat? You have all sorts of carnivorous races in your territory. Well, the lizardmen are farming fish. As for the rest. They exist much as they always have. I believe that the Sorcerer's Kingdom's subjects are prohibited from meeting one another? That is broadly the case, my lady, but I was permitted to make an exception for my subjects in specially designated areas. While the reign of the Sorcerer King brings about great change, I am afraid I lack the talent to bring about that change overnight. For the most part, I let my subjects live their lives while attempting to facilitate the formation of a society wherein everyone can participate. I feel that forming that sort of civilization naturally would be better than attempting to force the existing human-centric society of Erantel upon everyone. The fact that she was facing such a monumental task would go a long way in explaining why she had such a broad perspective on everything. To draw Dylan's right, Jolene wore a silly sort of blank look, as if unable to comprehend the Baroness' words. So to achieve this level of agricultural production, draw Dylan said, what do you do? Are other races employed as labor since the population of humans is small? While I would like for that sort of interaction to start happening between my subjects soon, 
Lady Saradnik replied, It is only humans and lizardmen that engage in large-scale agriculture. The lizardmen almost exclusively practice aquaculture, while humans tend to fields much as they appear to here. The undead are used for labor in my territory, which allows my tenants to manage much more than they otherwise would be able to. Druidic magic is also employed, but I don't believe that particular part is a foreign concept to the region. It wasn't, but druids weren't so common that every field could be augmented by magic. She doubted that any even existed in the Draconic Kingdom at this point. Still, it was something to keep in mind for the future. Maybe she could entice some druids to migrate from elsewhere? She wasn't even sure how she would go about doing that. I find it hard to believe that druids would so willingly work with the undead, Lady Zaradnik, Jolene said. Druids protect and promote the natural order and the undead are anathema to that order. What is natural is sometimes difficult to define, Lady Wenwin, Lady Zaradnik said. Negative energy ecologies are naturally opposed to what might be considered positive energy ecologies, but, at the same time, negative energy is a part of our existence. As a ranger, my understanding is that defending the natural order is not so much the explicit promotion of living ecologies, but maintaining the greater balance of the world. Draw Dylan's brow furrowed slightly at the Baroness words. How she expressed herself suggested that she was more well versed on the matter than she should be. It may have been a bias on Draw Dylan's part, but Lady Zaradnik sounded almost draconic in her understanding. What she shared was not something a human would usually be able to wrap their head around. Perhaps I'm just noticing things that aren't there. We are curious, Lady Zaradnik, Draw Dylan said. Are you acquainted with any dragons? I am, Your Majesty, Lady Zaradnik nodded. Frost dragons dwell in the Sorceress Kingdom and I am acquainted with several of them. One of them lairs in my territory, but it feels like she is away more often than not. Away where? Jolene asked. She's been wandering around the Baharuth Empire since early winter with a beastman merchant from the Sorceress Kingdom, Lady Zaradnik answered. I think they're in our winter right now. The stupefied look returned to Jolene's face. Draudelin leaned back in her seat, idly swirling a goblet of wine. Frost dragons were extremely naturalistic, so the Baroness may have been influenced by the dragon's views. Frost dragons were also solitary in nature so the ones she was acquainted with one sounded like deviants. We are unsure how the topic has wandered so far, she said, but there were some other topics that we wished to explore. Of course, your majesty, the baroness replied. How may I be of service? Countess Corlin delivers regular reports on your liberation efforts, but they are very, technical. We would like to know how our people are doing in a more personal sense. They're very resilient. In a way, they remind me of my people back when we were still a part of Rhea's ties. Our relationship with our demi-human neighbors was tenuous and death was an ever-present possibility. Yet, the people still held together, still managed to do what needed to be done. Does that make any sense? It does, Draw Dylan nodded. What is the sentiment like up there? I think most of the people's energy is focused on the upcoming recovery efforts. Some are even eager to take the fight to the Beastmen. All of them appear to be appreciative of your grace. Even after all that, these people are still. Though she knew better than to doubt it, it never ceased to amaze her. At the same time, she felt a crushing sense of shame. Her people never lost faith in her, yet she always hesitated to do what needed to be done. If I may ask, your majesty, Lady Zaradnik said, how would you like to proceed with your armed forces? At first, I thought it would be possible to raise commanders from the soldiers we relieved, but I didn't realize that commanders could not be commissioned from the ranks of common soldiers. Something similar should be true in the north, no? Draudelin asked, in Reistai's, nobles and knights command their respective regiments, companies and squads. While the majority of the imperial knights are from common backgrounds, the imperial army's commanders and generals are all nobles, as are the majority of its captains. That isn't incorrect, but, well, I understand why that is and I suppose it is simply where the Draconic Kingdom is in the development of its military. Your Majesty's army will be able to function at the company level and that is sufficient for the duties that are being assigned to them. Revisiting legislation can come at a later time should your court deem it necessary. Draudelin took a sip of her wine, comparing Baroness Zaradnik's demeanor to that of Countess Corlin and her party. In a word, the Baroness appeared to be far more tempered, though Draudelin wasn't sure whether it was due to the young noblewoman being reserved, strict or wise.
Countess Call intended to actively pursue the Sorcerer's Kingdom's political and economic agendas in the Draconic Kingdom. Draudelin had a measure of patience for the Countess' energy, but her court did not. As royalists, they had little tolerance for any foreign influence that crossed certain lines. As the days went on, it felt that four out of every five of Countess Corlin's proposals and avenues of discourse did so. Draudelin spent most of her energy guiding the proceedings in a manner that prevented too much antagonism from rising between her court and the Sorcerous Kingdom's delegation. As the scion of a merchant house, Countess Corlin was a bold risk-taker. She was intelligent and she was sensitive to the reactions of Draw Dillon's court, but only in the sense that she understood that her proposals were meeting staunch resistance. It didn't deter her, however, and she went on to attack the issue at hand from countless other angles in an effort to find workable solutions. The problem was that the problems Countess Corlin saw were not recognized as problems by Draw Dillon's court. To her court, there were no workable solutions as there were no problems to begin with. Continued attempts to address that problem were seen as the Sorcerous Kingdom's attempts to stick its nose where it didn't belong. Baroness Aradnik, however, stepped lightly and rarely struck. When she did, it was in a way where people went huh, what happened? But by then it was too late. Despite being from the same duchy, she was very different from the other noble women who had come from the Sorcerous Kingdom. If Colin and her delegation were merchants who pushed to make deals and seize opportunities, Zaradnik was a hunter who stalked and ambushed her prey. Well, she did say she was a ranger. We hope you do not take this the wrong way, Baroness, Draw Dillon said, but you seem more mature than the members of Countess Colin's party. I feel that this shouldn't be the case, Your Majesty, the Baroness replied. I am the oldest amongst us, but Countess Colin is only one season younger. Baroness Gonier is the youngest, and she is my junior by merely two years. Yet you are the only one dragging apprentices around, Draw Dillon noted. Most envoys representing a country would have larger teams of diplomatic staff, which would have many apprentices acting as aides. To be honest, this entire process was supposed to happen more, normally. Over a span of four or five years, at least. We ended up rushing things because we found out what was going on down here and we are most grateful for that. Perhaps everyone involved will cultivate a measure of understanding for these unique circumstances. To help with this, ah, since you are doing what you are doing, we would ask a favor of you. Of me specifically, your majesty? Umu, Draudelin nodded. Given the findings so far, we feel that it is prudent to appoint a new marshal. Both Jolene and Lady Zaradnik stared at her. The corner of Draudelin's mouth turned up in a smirk. Worry not, she waved her free hand lazily. While we will probably have plenty of lands to parcel out in the near future, we do not plan to turn you into a noble of the Draconic Kingdom. What we meant was that the Draconic Kingdom needs new marshals, but our army has lost the means to groom new ones for the position. We have selected a few candidates and we would ask that you act as a mentor to them. Lady Zaradnik quietly examined the tabletop, which had been cleared of empty dishes. Must it be this way, Your Majesty? Your army still has fine, loyal officers that these candidates can learn from. A marshal is also a courtier. We do not wish to cripple them politically. I feel the need to note that both nobles and commoners would receive the exact same standard of education as commanders in the royal army of the Sorcerous Kingdom. Even so, the fact that they are being instructed by a noble is what matters. It is simply how the Draconic Kingdom's culture works, and culture does not change so easily. If one pushes too hard, the people will push back even harder and grow more stubborn. You understand this, yes? Besides, we trust that you will do more than simply instruct them, you will set them on the proper path. In a very short time, Draudelin felt that Baroness Zaradnik had proven her steadfast character. When possessed of great wealth, authority or power, the true nature of an individual was revealed. Entrusting her with the very broadly worded royal writ shortly after her arrival was meant to be a test. In hindsight, Given how much wealth, authority and power was already at her disposal, it was an unnecessary one. Lady Zaradnik was more than steadfast, it was as if she was a great captain sprung forth from the most fantastical of legends, an impossible paragon. Even if Draw Dillon couldn't secure her for the Draconic Kingdom, she hoped that the Baroness could at least inspire her prospective marshals to aspire to her example. I am honored by Your Majesty's trust, Lady Zaradnik lowered her head. Though time for proper instruction may be limited, I will do what I can. 
Excellent, Drawdillon smiled. They will be sent to you once they have made their preparations. Their discussion remained casual until the time came for the court to reconvene. Captain Insera had composed himself once again and delivered his report. It felt like a harrowing tale to draw Dylan, but, going by the reactions of her court, they were all uplifted by the captain's account. The captain, too, looked like he was ready and willing to invade the Beastman country with nothing but a stick rather than traumatized by his experiences. In lieu of our marshals, Argabinus I said, I would humbly suggest that the results our good Captain Insera has reported be explored to their fullest extent. Our people have long suffered under the belief that they are no match for the Beastmen, but Highford has proven otherwise. Here, here, Kippel Auroras raised his voice. We must naturally ready ourselves for the next Beastman incursion. It would be foolish to not recognize the strength of the forces so graciously leased to us by the Sorceress Kingdom but we would be remiss in our duties to rely entirely on their power. Your proposal holds a number of merits, Ina nodded. But our resources are focused on restoring industry, Lady Delaros. Lena stared at Ina for a moment before exchanging looks with Arga and Kipola, who appeared to be equally at a loss. Draudilin's Minister of Finance licked her lips and looked up at the throne. We would have to research the costs and whether our budget can afford it. Ah, so cute and helpless. Draw Dylan let out a small sigh. If they were older, she would simply expect the members of her royal court to do their best despite their overwhelming task. Since they were young, however, they tickled the instinct to protect and nurture. Our government is busy enough as it is, Draw Dylan said, so that research will have to wait. However, Lady Saradnik, what are your thoughts on Binasai's proposal? There are areas where supporting his notion will not necessarily be at odds with the court's plans for economic recovery, the Baroness replied. Broadly speaking, this is the case for every industry that might be set aside in favor of those that are perceived to be more important. There are many specialized artisans and other vocations whose loss would also mean the loss of artifice, tradition and culture unique to the Draconic Kingdom or at least desirable for the future. Could you provide examples in the case of the military? A nation's military is not simply a body of soldiers that fights when called upon and nothing else. Many of the skill sets required by the military also carry over into other fields. For instance, Highfoot's logistical staff can be employed to help with logistics that need to be handled by Your Majesty's government. They have engineers who can participate in civil works. All institutions constantly search for talent, but, in the current environment, that talent will go to the places with the best prospects. So you are suggesting that to ensure that sufficient talent in these fields remains in the military, the court should allocate resources to the army and employ the army to assist with civilian recovery efforts? Where it can be applied, Lady Zaradnik nodded. The Baharuth Empire also practices this and they deem the results satisfactory. Industries that support your military should be subject to similar considerations. Unfortunately, this notion can't be applied to everything so your majesty's court must decide how to balance the rest. Draw Dylan mulled over the idea. The high fatality rate in the Draconic Kingdom's army usually meant that certain vocations were kept out of reach of the beastmen to preserve the investment that went into them. At least as out of reach as they could make it, which usually meant urban centers along the country's water transportation network. If they were needed for one task or another, they were deployed after Beastman attacks when the risk of losing them was lowest. The Draconic Kingdom's army was rather basic due to this. Lady Zaradnik's assumptions about their military were actually incorrect, but the members of Drawdillon's court were latching onto the ideas that she was presenting. Her nobles took turns asking questions of her, which she answered with her characteristically cool grace. Zaradnik has accommodated my maneuvering very smoothly, but she does it with such a straight face that I can only see her as being cheeky. Well, whatever, so long as it works. The collective tension created by the Beastman occupation, the Sorceress Kingdom's diplomacy and the Draconic Kingdom's domestic crisis had culminated into a battlefield where a different sort of war was being waged. Two sides had formed, at least when it came to the main conflict. Her government fought to preserve the Draconic Kingdom's identity while staying in control and facilitating a recovery on its own terms. Countess Corlin's delegation offered the assistance of the Sorceress Kingdom, but they wanted to fix everything in the process. The two sides did not mesh very well despite aiming for similar objectives, the fact that Countess Corlin's party was increasingly seen as a group of overreaching merchants only made things worse. 
Draw Dillon's entire court was being slowly backed into a corner by Countess Corlin and sentiment for the Sorcerer's Kingdom was growing poorer by the day. To counter the ongoing developments, Draw Dillon decided to recruit Baroness Saradnik, whom she had been grooming as a piece to put into play since the day of her arrival, to her cause. Maneuvering her into position did not take much effort, but the payoff looked promising. The first step was gauging her character and ensuring that it suited Draw Dillon's purposes. The next was to entrench the idea that the Baroness was someone who had earned their Queen's trust. Her court had picked up on this and had adopted her as an arbitrary existence that vaguely framed her as a commander or general, a position that was always appointed out of the ranks of the Draconic Kingdom's nobility. Countess Corlin appeared to be oblivious as to what was going on, though Draudelin knew that at least one other person in the Sorceress Kingdom's group of nobles understood the game that was being played. It helped that she also saw Baroness Zirodnik as someone who was naturally trustworthy and treated Draw Dillon's trust as a matter of course. The idea that the Baroness was helping to fix another aspect of the Draconic Kingdom also played into her expectations. Now, Lady Zirodnik was in the process of conducting an ambush, one that broke through the resistance of Draw Dillon's court while at the same time offering a reprieve against Countess Corlin's diplomatic assault. The army was traditionally seen as an institution run by the nobility. Baroness Saradnik's proposals sought to solidify the army and cultivate its power as a national institution. Thus, she appeared to the court as an ally who was helping to increase their power. Practically speaking, it wasn't much, but what mattered was that it would hopefully stabilize the sentiment of her court and allow them to perform their duties with confidence. Since it was the Baroness who was building this bastion for the nobility, it was one aspect where the Draconic Kingdom would become impervious to Countess Corlin's advances. If anything, she would see it as another agent of the Sorceress Kingdom somehow acting in their favor and would endorse Saradnik's efforts. The energy of her court grew around the ongoing discussion. Lady Saradnik kept purposely pulling Captain Insera into the conversation and, eventually, the court's hunger over the information he provided and how it could be used to their advantage had them completely disregard their difference in station. Draudelin smiled to herself as she quietly watched the proceedings. Of the four nobles from the Sorceress Kingdom, two understood what she was doing and were already on her side. As long as things kept going the way that they were, the future looked bright for the Draconic Kingdom. Fifteenth day, Upper Wind Month, 1 CE, 1100 hours. The shadow of a bone vulture crossed the edge of the thicket. Thurgak ducked back into the shadows. Several minutes later, she approached the threshold again, peeking out between the leaves. Her ears swiveled, alert for any sound. She tested the air for the odor of zombies, but the recent rains had suffused the air with the scent of damp soil and wet vegetation. Three days had passed since she separated from the group that she and her warriors had been escorting to safety, three days that she felt had mostly been wasted. It took her a day to reach the river and swim across, but the Osala she expected on the other side were gone. The next day consisted of her wandering around. She first went southwest to where their clan hold was supposed to be, finding them similarly absent. North, across the river from the clan hold, she found that the undead had surrounded Blighthold. The remains of Beastman dwellings on the south shore had been blasted apart. Not wanting to find out what would happen if she lingered too long, Thurgak went east to the next closest clan hold. In her time going back and forth, harbingers of the undead advance started to appear the cursed bone vultures that lazily circled overhead like carrion birds anticipating a battle. She checked the skies again before continuing on her way, heading for the distant walls of a human town. As she closed in on the settlement, she came across a pair of Osalo patrolling the fields outside. Two pairs of emerald eyes reflected the evening light as they examined her. Nah, Kira? Yes, that's right, Thurgak replied. I've come with news for the clan lord. The hold is on the other side of the town, the female of the pair said. You'll see it once you go around. Thurgak thanked them and jogged toward the town. The humans standing watch on the walls tensed when they saw her coming, but she kept herself out of the range of potential arrows and bolts. Life seemed undisturbed from its usual state, with neither the Osalo nor the humans acting out of sorts. They thought nothing of the bone vultures circling high overhead though she supposed that they just looked like birds from their usual altitude, and word of the clan across the river from Blighthold being displaced had apparently not reached them. Whether the other clan had not cared to inform them or had simply panicked and fled, she wasn't sure. Either way, 
She hoped that the fact that they had run away would help her convince the local clan to enact a prudent response. The last thing anyone needed was yet another 10,000 people joining the ranks of the undead. She met another set of Oselo on the other side of the town, who directed her towards what humans called a copstash a forest of strangely grown trees that were harvested for wood. This one was large as it supplied the nearby town, which she supposed was why it had been chosen for the local clan hold. The Oselo, the name which the Jaguar folk of their country referred to themselves by, were notably more reserved than the Irma. Most quietly rested in the shadows, their eyes following Thurgakra as she made her way deeper into the woods. She found the local lord similarly resting on the branch of an elm tree. One of his golden eyes opened to regard her. Narkira, he said in a smooth tone. What brings you to my clan hold? Thurgak lowered herself onto her haunches, dipping her head. Forgive me, she said, I know not the name of the one who rules here. Elinka Axosalo Balam, the Osalo Lord replied. Elinka Ax, I am Thurgak Narkira. I've come bearing news from the northwest. The tip of Elinka Ax's black tail twitched back and forth lazily. That was quick, he said. So has Elin Horsh sent you to brag about how amazing Irma Kisha is? Irma Kisha has been destroyed, Elin Kalax. The undead come. How would her parents have delivered the news? Her own words felt woefully inadequate for the situation. Elin Kalax's tail stopped. He raised his head from his branch to look down at her. Destroyed? Not pushed back? Not sent scurrying with their tails between their legs like impetuous youths with their pride beaten out of them? Less than a thousand remain, Elin Karax, Thurgak looked up at him. I came ahead of them to warn the clans. Warn the clans? The Oselo Lord's voice rolled softly through the branches. Another fellow came through earlier this week to do that. Narkira, just like you. Then some Irma runners came by to boast of their upcoming victory. That idiot Elin Horsh did that? I would laugh over the irony if catastrophe wasn't coming for us all. Wait. Her ears swiveled forward. Another Narkira? Was it Hold? Yes, I believe that was his name. He seemed very earnest. Hold claimed an unknown force, but powerful. The Irma runners that came later said several thousand. I thought it would be a foregone conclusion with the entirety of Irma Kisha on the warpath. How many of the undead remain? There are three clans in the vicinity and I suppose we'll have to clean up after Irma Kisha's mess. Elin Karax blinked slowly as he spoke. The Osalo Lord seemed mostly undisturbed by Irma Kisha's demise. It was an understandable reaction in normal times, a clan's destruction meant more territory for everyone else. Rather than the undead horde being weakened, Thurgak said, they were far too strong in the first place. Irma Kisha destroyed thousands of lesser undead, but it was a mere fraction of our enemy's strength. The undead do not order themselves as we do, Elin Karax they send the weak before the strong. When the strong undead finally appeared, none of the Irma who went to do battle survived. And what of you? A voice came from the side, why does one of Narkira stand before us to deliver this news? Should you not have fought and fallen with the others? Thurgak glanced towards the source of the new voice. A female Osalo covered in dark brown rosette sighed her from a branch above and to the right. Thurgak examined the canopy finding two dozen Osalo lounging in the trees. Because this information is too important not to be passed on, Thurgak addressed them. The undead come, and they will be upon you more quickly than you think. They come not only by land, but also by sea. The human city of Blighthold has already been surrounded and the clan hold to its south is no more. Elin Karax hopped off of his branch, stretching his arms and legs. His jaws opened in a wide yawn. It would have been nice if they had at least said something. He grumbled. How long until the undead arrive? They are already here, Thurgak replied. Some of the birds circling above are not birds at all, they are bone vultures sent by their masters to reconnoitre the land. I don't recall any tales where undead hordes use scouts. I believe it would be better to consider them an undead army, Elin Karax. They are no mere mindless swarm of the unliving, their masters are shrewd and employ strategies and tactics as the living do. The only thing slowing them down at the moment are all the humans that they're stopping to devour along the way. I fear to know how many tens of thousands of undead there are now. The Osailo Lord turned his gaze upwards. What say you? Amakisha had the assistance of Narkira, a voice drifted down from above. What choice do we have but to flee? The mountains are close, 
someone else said. It's a mere day to the foothills. Have you gone mad? The clan there will shred us. We need to join forces with the other clans out here. Two lie two days south of us. Will they allow us to approach? Food is scarce enough as it is. They at least appeared to be aware of all the issues that faced them. Their old home would not offer them welcome and their logistical issues made it difficult to consolidate with the other clans in the Draconic Kingdom. No matter which way we go, Elin Karak said, troubles await us. What we should decide is whether clans will choose to stand their ground. How many will we need to fight this menace? Narkira Thurgak blinked at his unexpected question. She had been prepared to face a clan adamant about defending its territory. I do not know the full extent of their power, she said. Based on what I've seen, all of them. All of them? All of them and more. This is a problem for the warrior clans to face. Not just a few of them, as many as we can convince. Twenty would be a good start. Even then, I am not sure if that will be enough. Incredulous voices filtered down from overhead. Twenty? How many countries are you trying to conquer here? Even if we could rally that many, we couldn't feed them. We can barely feed ourselves. I doubt that many would come. Taking so many from the homeland will open it to invasion from every direction. But if we don't stop the undead, the homeland will be invaded. Thurgak's ears flattened against her head as the discussion continued. She hadn't even started to consider the implications of the undead horde for the homeland. Their country was expansive and covered vast stretches of mountains and jungles, which meant that it had the population and power to match. That same advantage also meant that they had a large border to defend and each clan had their own piece of it to watch over. They had to constantly defend against the savage races of the Great Barrier Range that ran along their northern frontier. Their seemingly endless numbers and absurdly aggressive behavior made crossing through or even above the mountains impossible. To the south was the Great Loot, a stretch of sandy desert across dry mountains infested by all manner of hardy, and extremely opportunistic, tribes. To the east was the greatest threat, the Jogalan Commonwealth, an alliance of demi-human countries that waged intermittent wars with nearly all of their neighbors. Everyone considered them a menace as they constantly skirted the edge of turning their borderlands into undead-infested wastes. Well, maybe these undead might appreciate the Jogalans since they're doing their job for them. The Draconic Kingdom in the West had not demonstrated itself to be a threat compared to the rest of their neighbors. However, rumor had it that the Brightness Dragon Lord, one of the world's most ancient and powerful beings, had created the country in the wake of the Demon Gods. For that country, he had sired a sorceress lineage. Thus, they had stepped lightly around the Draconic Kingdom for generations, only doing half as much as they believed a dragon would tolerate in their domain. It wasn't until Kalilindrathanat Oraka, the great war master of the West, dared to challenge common knowledge by exploring the viability of conquering their western neighbor did things begin to change. Over the years, he carefully poked and prodded to analyze the Draconic Kingdom's reactions and gain knowledge of the land and its people. Barring being blasted into oblivion by a dragon lord, Khalil Endrath's foremost worry was that some powerful country lay on the other side. When they discovered that the Draconic Kingdom lay on the coast and only the humans appeared to be defending the land, Khalil Endrath embarked on a great venture to expand their nation's holdings. He didn't even need to rally the warrior clans, as the humans were so weak that the cast-off leavings of the common tribes could overwhelm them. The war master organized the flood of hopeful migrants into tribes and clans, transforming them into tributaries of Nartorica. Nartorica would be the muscle should human champions appear to resist them. It was the perfect plan. In fact, it went too perfectly, which resulted in too many people surviving the campaign. Little did they know that, in a tiny corner of the Draconic Kingdom, an undead horde would come bursting forth. Even if they knew of the existence of the Katza Plains beforehand, no one would have expected such a powerful force to exist since the relatively weak humans hadn't already been overwhelmed by them. Nartorica needs to be informed, Elin Karax said. They are overseeing the migration into these lands, but they are far from here. That is my task, Thurgak said but Narkira has been in the northwest for months. I was hoping you could point me in the right direction. They've established their seat of power at that lake on the Rolengork, the Osalo Lord replied. The wet season approaches, so everyone is settling down to weather the rains. Do they even have a rainy season here? I'm not sure, but it should at least flood the Rolengork. 
Our mystics mentioned that the human settlements along the river have been built to account for major changes in water levels. If that were the case, moving around and fighting the undead would become that much more problematic. Rivers would become difficult to cross without ships and the terrain would be churned into a muddy mire by tens of thousands of people moving over the land. Would Hull have reached Nartorica by now? Probably not. It was over 200 kilometers away from Oseolo Balam's clan hold and, like she, he was probably stopping to warn the people along the way of the undead threat. If he stopped at every clan hold, he would be less than halfway to his destination. In that case, Thurgak said, I should be on my way. Have you decided where to go, Elin Kaax? Southwest, the clan lord said. Along the foothills. There is still game to hunt along the way, so it will be better than imposing on other clans and risking confrontations. Compared to Elin Horshu, Elin Kaax felt far more level-headed. It was probably due to him being Oselo, however, they were patient predators who tended to be elusive even in their home jungles. Elin Kaax. An Oselo rushed in through the trees, undead have been spotted in the north. North? Not northwest? Ten kilometers north, the runner replied, heading southeast. The Oselo lord turned to look at Thurgakra. How far away was this undead horde that defeated Ermakesha? They should be crossing the river to the northwest at this point, Thurgak replied. Then how are they so close? They should be three times as far. Thurgak fell silent, staring at the ground as she reflected on the undead army's behavior. The wings move faster, she said. The wings? Elin Karax narrowed his eyes, explain. I told you, it's an undead army. When I was still escorting the fleeing Ermakisha, the undead attacked us from the shore. They've been stopping to consume human settlements along the way, but the wings do not encounter as many. I presume that is why the ones that came out of the water got so close when we thought we were well away from their advance. Human settlements are more sparse along the foothills, so similar behaviors may apply. I see. That makes sense, but shouldn't that mean they're coming this way now? Between the clan hold and this human town, there are enough people to draw them straight to us. There are more of those birds above us, Elin Karax, someone said from the canopy. Thurgak said they were undead, yes? Then it's time to go, Elin Karax said. Send runners out and warn the tribes to the east and south. What about the west? If the undead have crossed the river, then the furthest ones already know. They'll warn everyone else along the way. Elin Karax turned to address Thurgak. Thank you for coming to warn us, Narkira, he said. You may reprovision yourself in our territory if you require. Hopefully, Nartorica can figure out a way to deal with this. Perhaps we'll meet again on the Roland Gork. Though it appears to have been late, Elin Karax, Thurgak bowed, thank you for heeding my warning. I wish you and your clan good fortune in the coming days. Thurgak rose from her bow and turned to leave. Then the canopy exploded into flames. She covered her head as burnt and charred Osela rained onto the ground around her. Why are you still standing there? Elin Karax snarled, get your warning to Nartorica. She dashed out of the trees, accompanied by the screams and cries of burning Oselo. Fire continued to rain from the sky, but she couldn't feel its heat against her back. Magic, are those fireballs? Second tier casters were common enough in their homeland, but third tier casters were very rare. She had only heard of fireball from tales before coming to the Draconic Kingdom. Despite the humans' weakness, they were more prolific when it came to magic. Accounts of previous excursions to the Draconic Kingdom even spoke of the defenders using fourth and fifth tier spells. Thurgak dared to glance over her shoulder as she cleared the copse. Sure enough, several elder liches were sending spheres of flame into the trees. She twisted in midair to slap down a bone vulture diving after her, regaining her feet and pouncing upon it before it could take flight again. Another pale form entered the corner of her vision. She turned to swipe at it. Her arm turned cold as her claws harmlessly passed through the throat of a ghostly gnar. Thurga cursed. Focus battle aura, luminous claw. Her return strike flashed across the incorporeal figure, which let out an unearthly wail. She followed through her first attack with a quick series of light imbued slashes. Her chest heaved as the wraith dissipated into the air. Thurgak released her martial arts and resumed her run, gauging the shortness of her breath. Damn thing drained my vitality, just what I needed. It wasn't enough to incapacitate her, but the distance she could cover in a day would be significantly reduced. 
she needed to find a mystic with lesser restoration. Thurgax scanned the field, searching for a tribe she could request healing from, but a grim scene played out everywhere she looked. Undead fell upon hapless Osalo, sending them into a chaotic flight. Swarms of wraiths swept into the copses of trees scattered across the countryside. With Osalo Balan formed out of the commoner castes, they wouldn't have martial arts or skills that imbued their attacks with magic or elemental properties. Their claws wouldn't be able to make a single scratch on the incorporeal undead. Pairs of elder liches flew overhead far beyond the reach of their victims. The points of crimson light in their skull seemed to flare with every new wave of suffering that echoed into the cloudy skies. Thurgak kept a low profile, running on all fours through the grass. With every step, she expected to be consumed by a fireball or crippled by some foul necromantic spell, but, somehow, the sounds of slaughter slowly grew distant. She didn't slow down to ponder her miraculous escape, but she did ponder the abrupt change in the undead army's movements as she ran. While she reasoned that their unexpected advance was due to the lack of humans slowing them down, the sheer aggression displayed against Chisalo Balam was unprecedented. Though she thought that, it was more typical of the unrelenting, hateful attacks that people expected of the undead. Elin Karax's fears had come to pass. The combined population of his clan hold and the nearby human town was a tantalizing target for the undead. Then again, Blighthold had been surrounded and there was no sign of the same behavior. What did it mean? Was it a coalition of undead, after all? Did a faction within their ranks harbor a different opinion on how they should advance? One that had views that were more natural to the undead? At the least, it meant that no Night Lich dominated all of the Elder Liches in the Undead Army. There would be no divided opinions if that were the case. If so, could it be used to their advantage? By stringing the undead out across the land into groups that were too far to support one another, they could be defeated bit by bit by a unified, superior force. Her thoughts continued to mill as she jogged westward. The sun was halfway across the horizon when she spotted a copse with Osalo occupants. A group of cubs playing in the trees stopped to watch Thurgak when she crossed into the edge of the trees. I've come to speak to your chief, she knelt to speak to them. Can you tell me where he is? One of them, a female with a black pelt of barely visible rosettes, pointed a claw towards the interior. As with Elin Karax's clan hold, the tribe's chief was in a shaded grove of the tallest trees, stretched out over a low branch. Narkira, he said. What brings you to my tribe? Amakisha has been destroyed by an undead army coming from the northwest, Thurgak told him. Elinkar Axe has ordered Osalo Balam to flee southeast along the foothills. I would think that Elinkar Axe would send one of our own to inform us, the Osalo Lord said. Elinkar Axe's clan hold came under attack less than two hours ago. I do not know if any have survived. Murmurs drifted down from the branches overhead. Also, Thurgak said, Elder Liches are bombarding large copses like these with fireballs, so you may want to come down. The leaves rustled as Osalo landed on the damp humus all around her. Before her, the Osalo Lord rose to his full, two and a half metre height. What else did Elin Karax say? Where are we to go? As far as wherever the clans decide to make their stand, Thurgak said. I have been tasked to warn Nartoraka of the coming threat, on that note. Do you have any mystics who can cast lesser restoration? A wraith drained my vitality on the way here. The Osailo Lord glanced at a mystic nearby. The mystic shook her head. I'm sorry, Narkira, she said. The closest second tier mystics were at the clan hold. I see. She hadn't really expected to find any. While second tier mystics were easily found in the cities of her homeland, they were rarer in tribal communities. This was especially the case since the people coming to the Draconic Kingdom were those who the clans at home did not wish to keep. Only a bare minimum of weaker mystics had come to support the migrating tribes. In that case, Thurgak said, I must be on my way. Please, take care of yourselves. Ludmilla nodded to herself as an elder lich reached out to remove another beastman tribe from the map. It had been a tense day, with the forces from Katza crossing the Sealand River. They faced a new set of challenges. Namely, the Beastman tribes uprooting themselves and fleeing. Unlike the Lion Beastmen north of Blighthold, the Jaguar Beastmen on the other side of the Sealand had a more elusive nature. When the clan hold south of the city was shattered by Ruin's Wake, the expectation was that they would run for a while before consolidating to defend their territory. Instead, 
they paused for about a day before fleeing en masse. At first, her general staff speculated over whether they had been too forceful by having Ruin's wake chase the beastmen away. A day later, however, tribes elsewhere in the province started moving well before the undead arrived. The staff concluded that information was traveling well ahead of the undead advance, and the beastmen's reaction to that information had resulted in an undesirable outcome. Simply put, running beastmen still needed to eat and there were too many beastmen on the run. The fighting that they expected hadn't happened, so they needed to reduce the number of beastmen. Otherwise, they would eat their way backwards across the Draconic Kingdom at an unacceptable rate. Their first adjustment was to increase the pace of the undead advance. The original rate had been set to match the limit of what the lion beastmen could cover in a day, which was about 20 kilometers with children and the elderly. Zombies looked slow at a glance, as they could only walk 2 kilometers per hour. They could walk 24 hours per day without tiring, however, so they more than doubled the beastmen's daily rate. The forces on the ground now moved at the zombies' maximum speed, sweeping up the remaining lionfolk and beginning their cleanup of the panther beastmen. Their wings going ahead along the northern foothills and the shores of the inland sea matched their pace, keeping the beastmen from fleeing back to their country or seeing the occasional convoy of barges delivering goods to Oracolon. Wraiths, bone vultures and elder liches were sent to head off the fleeing tribes furthest ahead. Flying undead, of course, could move much faster than their soldiers on the ground. More importantly, that speed was expected of them so the beastmen probably wouldn't expect that they were being used to purposely pick off the tribes at the head of the pack. Wraiths, especially, proved useful for this. A single one could wipe out a small tribe in short order as those tribes lacked the means to fight back against an incorporeal assailant. As for the Draconic Kingdom's citizens, well, she wasn't sure how they felt about having their land swarmed over by fleeing beastmen, then swarmed over by the pursuing undead, but they would recover from the experience eventually probably. Ludmilla checked the time. She would be due soon for her evening report. Do we have any other major kinks to work out? She asked. No, my la captain, Willuvian answered. I think we have things back under control for now. I'm off, then, Ludmilla said. After the audience, I'll be heading back to the front. She collected her reports and headed out the door. Given the violence and chaos of the day's operations, she probably had a lot of negative energy to remove from the province. Maybe her armor should have been fashioned in the appearance of a maid outfit instead. The longer skirts would be welcome. She was starting to become accustomed to the short skirts of the equipment that had been granted to her. At this rate, she would think nothing of all the other things that Lady Shultier had her wear in private. Ludmilla crossed the hall entering the delegation's state room to have Amelia check over her appearance. When she crossed over into the back half and entered the lounge, she found Clara and Leanne lying listless on the couches. Florian was sitting at a desk, penning something out with a focused expression. What happened to you two? Ludmilla asked. Clara tilted her head upward to throw an upside-down stare at Ludmilla. Her amethyst eyes lacked their usual luster. Our proposal, Clara pouted. It was rejected.